What is up, YouTube? This is Homicidal T with your host, Rainy B, and I've got another weird story to tell this time. Okay, now, while I've been on a roll of really effed up cases lately, here comes another one. I've been going down this really dark rabbit hole, and I love it. I found another great channel. I think I've mentioned him, Lazy Masquerade. Whoa weird stuff over there. I love it. And this one came up and I recognized the picture and I didn't remember the story, but I knew that the story was really effed up. Well, it turns out that I didn't know shit. This story is way worse than I ever thought it was. If you're going to look into the story, some of these aliases used may be used at different times. I am simplifying it by only using one or two that was used, but I just want to put that out there so that if you see different names whenever you research this, you won't think, oh, Rainy doesn't know anything. I do know crap. But if I told this story with 100% accuracy, you guys would be like, okay, Clarence, now who's Sharon? What about Tonya? Who's Suzanne? Where's Michael? Those are all the names of the same people. So simplifying is just going to make it a little easier to follow. Now, Franklin Delano Floyd, let me stop already. Delano, did you know that Franklin Delano Roosevelt, his middle name was not Delano? His middle name is Delano, D-E-L-A-N-O. I thought it was Delano my entire life. 46 years I've been thinking. I mean, I guess I haven't been thinking about Franklin Delano Roosevelt for straight for 46 years, but I mean, you know, somewhere in my head, I've always had that R on the end. Weird. But anyway, back to the story. Franklin Delano Floyd was a lifetime criminal. He's starting around 12 years old. And he had a weird upbringing that would kind of mold this freak show into what he turned out to be. You can definitely research it online and find a lot about what he got into, but I'm just going to kind of just vaguely touch on it because I feel like it takes away from the victim. So in 1974, Franklin started using aliases to hide who he was so that people wouldn't know about his past and what he'd done. You know, things like police shootouts, kidnapping, sexually assaulting women and children. The kind of things that a normal woman might think was a red flag if he met them. Well... One of these women, unfortunately, that he met was named Sandy Chipman. He met her at a North Carolina truck stop, and Chipman was the mother of four children to two different fathers, Suzanne, Allison, Amy, and Philip. Now, after only a month of dating, Franklin and Chipman married, and somehow he convinced her to move to Dallas with him. In 1975, Sandy Chipman was picked up from passing bad checks. Now, she was sentenced to 30 days in jail for it, and during this time she was going to be incarcerated, she entrusted her husband naturally to watch the children. Well, when she got out, her husband and her children were gone. Sandy eventually found that two of her middle daughters were at a, this was Allison and Amy, they were at a church-operated social services group. She never found her oldest child, Suzanne, or her youngest child, Philip. Now, Sandy just assumed that he was dead for some reason, and who knows what kind of lifestyle that she led, but that's all I could find online about that. One of his sisters did later learn that he had been privately adopted in North Carolina shortly after that, so... He wasn't found, actually, his identity wasn't found until 2019 with DNA tests confirming it. Crazy. So Chipman attempted to file kidnapping charges, but then she was told by the authorities that the stepfather, Franklin, had a right to take the kids. So that part of the case, unfortunately, just kind of quietly went into the abyss. Now, Franklin was gone, gone. Like, no one had seen hiding or hair of him in a while. So we found out later that he was leading a pretty nice life with his new wife, Tanya Don Hughes, in Oklahoma. He, Tanya, and her infant son, Michael, were all living in Tulsa. But she was growing fearful of Franklin. Now, she was working as a stripper, giving all of her earnings to an increasingly violent Franklin. Now, I said he was leading a nice life, not working, getting money from his stripper wife, and dominating anyone and everyone in his path. That was his own little slice of paradise. You know, Tanya often thought about how things could have been different. Now, she was pretty smart, and she was smart enough to earn a full ride to Georgia Institute of Technology to study aerospace engineering, but more on that later. Things started getting worse in April of 1990. Now, Hughes had decided to run away with a college student that she had a secret relationship with, and she was planning on taking Michael with her. That month, Hughes' body was found lying on the side of the highway outside of Oklahoma City. She was rushed to the Presbyterian Hospital in Oklahoma City with severe head contusions and bleeding on the brain and at the base of her skull. These injuries ultimately took her life. Now, police assumed that she had been struck from behind in a hit and run while walking from the nearby Motel 6 to the store. Now, when Franklin was told that she was dying, 
he was indifferent and didn't even come to the hospital. While she was in a coma, she kept mumbling the words daddy and died alone. When Franklin finally arrived at the hospital the following day, very coldly he claimed that he'd fallen asleep at the Motel 6 after uh, Hughes had gone to pick up some groceries. At the time of Tanya's death, the couple were also suspects in a 1989 disappearance of 18-year-old Cheryl Ann Comesso, a former co-worker of Tanya Hughes that Franklin believed had reported them for welfare fraud. Comesso had disappeared following an angry confrontation with Franklin, and he was the lead suspect in his wife's death as well. So following the death of Hughes, Franklin put two-year-old Michael into foster care and left the state. Michael's foster parents told authorities that the boy was in really bad shape and extremely behind in development, but he had made remarkable progress since he was in their care. In 1994, the couple began adoption proceedings, and six months after Michael was placed into foster care, Franklin attempted to regain custody of Michael. As a part of the adoption process with Michael's foster parents, Michael's DNA was compared to Franklin's to establish paternity, and it was discovered that Franklin was not Michael's biological father, so when he tried to regain custody by adopting Michael, due to the fact that he was a convicted felon and he had no relation to him, he was quickly denied. On September 12, 1994, Michael was in the first grade at Indian Meridian Elementary School in Choctaw, Oklahoma. Franklin forced Principal James Davis to take him to Michael's classroom at gunpoint and then forced both of them into his pickup truck. Now, when they finally reached a wooded area, Franklin forced the principal out of his car and handcuffed him to a tree and sped off with Michael. The principal was later rescued. When Franklin was arrested two months later in Louisville, Kentucky, Michael was not with him, and he has not been seen since. Franklin Floyd told a million different stories over the next three decades, finally coming clean in 2015, admitting to killing Michael the same day that the kidnapping happened, and he shot him twice in the back of the head. He also claimed that he dumped him along I-35, and they've never recovered anything, and they don't think they will. But oh my god, it gets worse. The investigation into the death of Tanya Hughes and the kidnapping of Michael uncovered more questions than answers. There's a saying that you really don't know where you're going until you know where you've been. Now let's dig out of this rabbit hole and start a new one. It was discovered that Franklin had raised Tanya Hughes as his daughter since her early childhood. DNA testing to determine her paternity uncovered that she was not even Franklin's biological daughter. Franklin had given a number of inconsistent statements regarding on how she came to be in his custody. One story was that he rescued Hughes and that she was abandoned by her biological parents. The earliest known record of Hughes was in her elementary school in Oklahoma City in 1975. She was registered under the name Suzanne Davis. Now, authorities suspected that she was born somewhere in 1960s, late 1960s, and was kidnapped by Franklin sometime between 73 and 75. It was not revealed until 2014 that Tanya Hughes had been identified as Suzanne Marie Savakis, the oldest daughter of Sandy Chipman, who had disappeared with Franklin, her stepfather, in 1975. It was then that investigators realized that Franklin had dragged young Suzanne around state to state to state all across America and made up false identities for both of them all along the way. They had lied to the schools and she attended and said that her mother had died in a hit and run. Sound familiar? Foreshadowing as it so exactly what would happen to Tanya now known to be Suzanne. Well from here on out Suzanne will be Suzanne not Tanya anymore just saying that because it gets pretty confusing. So they moved from Georgia to Florida in the late 80s and Suzanne was pressured in becoming a stripper by Franklin and he took 100% of her profits. And at this point, his alias was Clarence, or Michael Hughes, and Suzanne became Tanya Don Hughes. And in 1989, he forced her to marry him, and he went from pretending that she was his daughter to his wife. So around that time, Franklin also became acquainted with Cheryl Ann Comesso, a fellow stripper who worked with Suzanne in Pinellas County, Florida. She went missing in 1989. Now, Comesso's disappearance remained unsolved until her skeletal remains were found in 1995 by a landscaper in an area off of Interstate 275 in Pinellas County, Florida. 
She had been listed as a Jane Doe until a year later when her remains were identified. A forensic archaeologist determined that she died from a particularly vicious beating and two gunshot wounds to the head. Franklin and Suzanne Savekas had been persons of interest in this case after co-workers said in the strip club that they worked witnessed an altercation between Franklin and Camesso. It was then that Franklin and Suzanne fled to Oklahoma to be known as Michael and Tanya Hughes. We know what happens after that. Now, on a separate but equally disturbing note, in March of 1995, a mechanic in Kansas found a large envelope stuffed between the truck bed and the top of the gas tank of a truck he'd recently purchased at an auction. He found nearly 100 photographs in the envelope, including many photographs of a woman who had been bound and severely beaten. Police traced these photos back to Franklin after they realized that Franklin had stolen this truck and dumped it in Texas. Investigators also compared the photographs of the injured woman with Camesso as well. And evidence found with her remains and found in the clothing and the photographs were similar. The medical examiner also compared the injuries seen in the photograph to the cheekbone of Camesso's skull and found that they were consistent. Many of the pictures contained images of furniture and other belongings that were identified as belonging to Franklin as well. And he was tried and convicted for Camesso's murder on the basis of that photographic evidence found in that truck. Other photos found in the truck show sexual abuse of Savekas in early childhood. Authorities, they found photos of her in sexually explicit poses at various ages, starting around age four. In 2001, while awaiting trial for Camessa's murder, Judge Nancy Lay ruled that Franklin was incompetent to stand trial and ordered him to undergo further mental evaluation. Now, Franklin, he fought against this assessment, asserting that he was competent. Well, go on, girl. Defend yourself. Several months later, the judge reversed this previous ruling and ordered him to stand trial. He was convicted and sentenced to death. Hmm. Sorry, I just love that kind of part. Now... What he was convicted of are the cases involving the 1989 murder of Cheryl Ann Camesso, as well as the kidnapping of six-year-old Michael from the elementary school. Now, Floyd is only considered a person of interest in the 1990 hit-and-run against the death of his wife, daughter, Tanya Hughes. And, of course, I mean, you know, I'm really excited about the fact that, you know, he got the death penalty, but... You know, I've been watching, like, a lot of Lazy Masquerade, and it turns out, like, overseas, whenever they get sentenced to death, boom, next year, they're gone. Bye. Now, I understand there's people on death row that are not guilty, and that those cases suck. And I totally, I have different beliefs and what I believe a death penalty case should be. Like, a lot of them, especially if they brag about it, like the Night Stalker, you know, Richard Ramirez, those kind of things. Bye, Felicia. Go, bye. You know, I mean, yeah. But... Like, this guy, he, he admitted it. So, why are we not getting rid of him sooner? I don't, I don't understand why it takes so long to appeal and stuff. So, why, why would you appeal? You're guilty. Shut up. Anyway. But that's all I have on this one. Oh, my gosh. Isn't that crazy? I didn't know this picture had such a bad backstory. I remember it from maybe Forensic Files or cold case files I can't remember but it was something in the 90s and I remember being riveted by that picture and thinking oh man and it stuck with me so that's kind of a bookmark in my head of I had hope you guys enjoyed this and I hate saying enjoyed this because it's not something to enjoy it's just interesting you know so I mean there's just these twists and turns that happen and sometimes you wonder like when a kid's like acting up at a grocery store and you look over at it like shut up is there a reason that kid's acting out so bad? You know, I mean, it makes you really start thinking when you go past people and you see they have, like, garbage bags around their windows in their garage. It's like, what you got in that garage? I can't go on a run in my neighborhood without thinking there's a person being held hostage in there. True crime makes you a little nutty. So I'm glad to be friends with y'all because y'all are crazy too because you're here. So, <laughs> We'll see you on the next one, and I really like not doing my makeup on these, so I'm probably going to go to the short version, even though this one was pretty long. <laughs> Until next time, if you want to subscribe to my channel, click on the little logo, or you can click here. Or if you want to watch more videos, you can click here. I'll see you later.